Okay, let's continue with our discussion of mitosis, and we need to talk about its evolutionary history. So, um, we can assume that since prokaryotes evolved before eukaryotes, mitosis probably evolved from binary fission. And there are certain protists that exhibit types of cell division that seem intermediate between binary fission and mitosis. So, that just means they're not quite binary fission and they're not quite mitosis, they're somewhere in the middle along the spectrum. So as you look here, in A, it shows ba a bacteria cell. I, technically, I suppose this is still one cell, um, but the chromosome has been replicated and the cell wall is pinching in. Here, um, this is dinoflagellates are a type of um, typically marine or aquatic organism. Um, that's about it. Let's go with that. Dinoflagellates, they swim around with their flagella and um, yeah, so here we go. In dinoflagellates, you can see they have um, one, one chromosome here um, that's being stretched apart, but it's happening in with an intact nuclear envelope here. Um, and then diatoms, which make diatomaceous earth, these usually have sparkly um, exoskeletons, and some types of yeast, they also have an intact, um, an intact nuclear envelope um, and as you can see these are getting pulled to opposite sides of their two chromosomes so not quite like what we would imagine and then not what we would imagine but what we're used to I suppose and then this is how most eukaryotes end up dividing so you can see that we have these two have intact nuclear envelopes this one is further divided between the top and the bottom sort of similar to and also different from the mitosis that we're used to. So the frequency of cell division varies with the type of cell and these differences are always going to result from something that's occurring at the molecular level and this is a way to regulate the cell cycle. So for example, um, cells that manage to escape the normal controls of the cell cycle result in cancer or uncontrolled cell division. The cell cycle appears to be driven by specific chemical signals that are present in the cytoplasm. And uh, there was an experiment where they took cultured mammalian cells at different phases of the cell cycle, and they were fused to form a single cell with two nuclei. And this provided some evidence for this hypothesis um, about this, the, um, the regulators or the chemical signals being present in the cytoplasm. So. Um, here we have two experiments, and what this first one tells us is that when a cell in the S phase was fused with a cell in G1, so these are two cells in two different phases, um, the nucleus immediately entered the S phase and DNA was synthesized. But over here, when we took, oh, I'm sorry, over here when we took a cell in the M phase and we fused it with a cell in G1, then the G1 nucleus took over and immediately began, or the G1 nucleus immediately began mitosis. Um, so a spindle formed, chromatin condensed, even though the chromosome had not been duplicated. So this seems to indicate that there are certain regulators within the cytoplasm that are present at certain times that are stronger or have a am more amplified effect than others. The sequential events of the cell cycle are directed by a distinct cell cycle control system, which is similar to a clock or a biorhythm, perhaps. The cell cycle control system is regulated by internal and external controls, and the clock has checkpoints where the cell cycle stops until it gets the signal to go ahead. So you can think of it kind of like, uh, like a factory, and people have to constantly run on schedule and if something uh, is running on schedule but the quality assurance officer says whoa 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 this wasn't done correctly then everything has to stop until it is done correctly. So here we have um, a picture of our cell cycle just like we were looking at previously but as you can see there's a checkpoint here for mitosis so the cell will not completely divide or it won't completely finish dividing unless everything is okay at this checkpoint. And then same during the G1 checkpoint. We have a checkpoint right here um, during the G1 phase. And if everything isn't the way it should be when it reaches this G1 checkpoint, then the cell goes, it does no, not continue this 
uh, the rest of the cycle. And same with the G2 check plate. So consider how important it might be for a cell in the G2 checkpoint uh, because the synthesis of DNA has occurred and then the cytoplasm has multiplied, all of the organelles have multiplied and everything that the cell needs to divide, basically this checkpoint is a point in time where the cell can look back and say, gee, if we divide, will this cell survive? And if the answer is yes, then it continues on into mitosis. So for many cells, the G1 checkpoint actually seems to be the most important. So if a cell receives a go-ahead at the G1 checkpoint, it will usually complete S, G2, M phases, and then finally divide. But if it does not receive the go-ahead signal, then it exits the cell cycle, and it switches to a non-dividing state called the G0 phase. Um, the G0 phase is not necessarily for defunct cells that don't meet this G1 checkpoint system, um, a lot of cells that are density dependent will, will switch to the G0 phase simply because there's no room left for them to grow. So here's the checkpoint. If the cell receives the go-ahead signal, then it continues to divide. But if it does not, then it exits the cell cycle and enters this G0 phase. So the cell cycle clock is regulated by proteins, uh, cyclins, and cyclin-dependent kinases. So we've got, these are both regulatory uh, regulatory proteins, and we call the cyclin-dependent kinases CDKs. So these depend on cyclin. So CDKs activate, their activity fluctuates during the cell cycle because they're controlled by cyclins. So they get their name from the fact that their concentrations vary within the cell cycle. Then there's another um, protein called MPF or maturation promoting factor that is a cyclin CDK complex so both of them kind of functioning together and that's going to trigger a cell's passage past the G2 checkpoint so that it can enter into the M phase. So if you're looking at MFP and cyclin concentration this purple line represents cyclin and the orange line represents MFP and you can see that MFP kind of spikes during mitosis, during each um, phase of mitosis. And cyclin kind of right around the S phase starts to increase, 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 reaches its peak somewhere during mitosis, and then immediately drops off and is very low during the G2 and into the S phase. So this is um, a graph of what this looks like, and here is a, a visual of what this looks like. Uh, more of a Venn diagram. So you can see if we're talking about um, here, oh, well, where should we start? Let's see, mitosis. We start with the CDK that continues on into the G2 checkpoint. Then cyclin comes in forming this complex, which is called MPF. Okay, and then once mitosis occurs, the cyclin is degraded. The CDK continues around and around and around and cyclin is accumulating, and as it does, we get to the MPF again, which is that complex between cyclin and CDK. So G0 not only occurs when a cell is told, eight, don't divide, at that G1 checkpoint, but it also occurs when a cell specializes. Uh, so if a cell has a particular job or is differentiated to do something, then it will simply remain in that G0 phase. And a cell can be prompted to re-enter the cycle if the appropriate cues are present. So, for example, um, if repair is needed or, or if the tissue has been damaged and the cell needs to uh, divide in order to repair the tissue. Non-dividing cells may have exited the cell cycle completely. So, non-dividing cells are cells like, um, well, I would say neurons. However, neurons have recently been there's been a lot of research to indicate that neurons actually will divide, uh, albeit very slowly. Uh, they also may be, these non-dividing cells may be holding at a particular stage in the cell cycle. So there are not only checkpoints that say go, but there are also checkpoints that tell it to stop. So an example of an internal signal would, for example, be the kinetochores not attached to spindle microtubules to send a molecular signal that delays anaphase. So for example, remember the kinetochores are those pieces of cytoskeleton that attach to the kinetochore or 
probably what would have been the centromere when the chromosomes were attached, when the chromatids were attached. If they're not attached to a particular chromosome, then they would send a signal that says, hey, we shouldn't start spreading apart yet because we don't have control over all of the chromosomes. There are also some external signals, for example, growth factors. So growth factors would be proteins, possibly even hormones maybe, released by certain cells that are going to stimulate other cells to divide. There's a clear example of external signals. What I mentioned previously would be de density-dependent inhibition. So, for example, if you have cells on a Petri dish and the cells form a single layer on that Petri dish, the cells will enter G0 and they will stop dividing. And so that is considered density dependent because there is no more space. The cells are as dense as they can be while all obtaining the nutrients they need to survive. A lot of animal cells also exhibit what is called anchorage dependence. So in other words, they have to be anchored to some kind of a substrate or substratum, in this case, in order to divide. So if they're not somehow anchored to that material, whatever that material may be, then the cells will not divide. Cancer cells, however, kind of throw caution to the wind, regardless of what cell they originate in, and they just continue to divide and divide and divide. So density-dependent inhibition and anchorage dependence don't really apply to cancer cells. So anchorage dependence means here, these cells here must be attached to something, some type of growth medium or substrate in order for them to grow. Density-dependent inhibition tells us that these cells will grow and fill up this entire space, whatever that space is, only in one layer. And then if we remove some cells, we now have a hole. And so these cells that are surrounding the hole will divide in order to fill it up again. And this is what happens normally. Cancer cells, however, will continue to divide no matter what. And as you can see, they form multiple layers here, which is quite unusual. Uh, for most mammalian cells, or cells that are found in mammals. And you can tell, too, if you look at these, the electron micrograph, uh, that they look quite different from each other as well. So, the loss of cell cycle controls results in cancer cells. They don't respond normally, cancer cells, to the body's control mechanisms. They don't need growth factors to be able to grow and divide, as far as we know. They could possibly make their own growth factor, uh, they could convey a growth factor signal without the presence of the growth factor, or they may have abnormal cell cycle control. Uh, there's a lot about cancer that we don't know, and cancer is so diverse. There are so many types of cancer um, that it's almost impossible to generalize. We may know more about certain types of cancer, but in general, the cure for cancer is elusive. So there are recent advances, of course, in understanding the cell cycle, and the more we can understand about the cell cycle and its cycle and its signaling, um, that helps us lead to an advances in cancer treatment. So, here we have basically an overview of what we've been discussing. Here is a diagram of the cell cycle. This is what happens during mitosis, and this should look rather familiar to you. As you can tell, there are various cells here in various stages of mitosis. So, what I um, this is. Most likely an onion root tip, perhaps not. Uh, but if I were you, I would challenge yourself right now to see if you could go ahead and identify cells that are in all five stages of mitosis. So pause the diagram, or pause this screencast. Okay, now that you've come back, we have a normal cell here in interphase. I would call this one an anaphase. Note it, oh, I'm sorry, blah, 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 just kidding. This one's in metaphase because they're lined up in the middle. Here they are very distinctly drawing apart. This is definitely anaphase. Um, I would argue that these cells here, oops, these cells right here are approaching telophase. And this is a very, very, I would say late stage telophase. It's difficult to tell from this diagram, but perhaps early metaphase. This would be yeah, early metaphase, early interphase. This one, you can start to see the chromosomes are starting to condense, so this would be a prophase. And I didn't do those in order, but I think I've identified them all. So um, I hope that you were successful in that. All right, thank you.